So in this lecture, we're going to talk about conditional probability. And we're going to start off with an example. So let's look at an example of conditional probability. And the example here is that we're going to survey, we're going to pretend that we survey uh, William and Mary students um, uh, about their political affiliation. Uh, about um, political affiliation. <clears throat> and so we can draw a table. Um, let's say political affiliation and gender. And we can draw a table here. Here's going to be my table of the results of my survey. So um, the table is going to have category for men and women. And we can pretend that we have kind of two political parties that the students could be members of, either party A or party B. And um, let's write affiliation and gender. And we can make up some numbers for our results. Maybe 501 men say they're part of party A, 782 women say they're part of party A, 238 men say they're in party B, and 123 women say they're in party B. <clears throat> and a question I might want to ask, which is kind of going to be the focus of this lecture, is if I randomly select a student, What is the probability uh, Well, let's start with a simple question. Let's just first ask, if I randomly select a student, what's the probability they are a woman? All right? That's a simple question, okay? Not quite a conditional probability question, but a question we can answer with the table. So we can say, okay, you know, we could write this in some kind of faux notation. What's the probability of a woman? Okay, assuming my survey is kind of um, representative and I <clears throat> randomly select a woman, well, we can fill in some totals. How many men are there total in our survey? 739. And how many women are there? Do the math, and that's 905. So we can fill in what is called a margin of our table. And so we see that in total, we can fill in a box here, we have 1644 students in the survey. And of them, 905 are women. So a reasonable way to say approximate the probability that uh, a randomly selected woman, uh, student as a woman would just be take 9 to 5 and divide by 1644, and we get something about 55%. Seems like a reasonable approximation. I could slightly alter this question. Now we really are getting into the meat of the, of the lecture. And I could say, what if I am given some information? So given that the student is uh, a member of party B, so political party B, comma, what is the probability they are a woman? So this is what's known as conditional probability um, because we are conditioning on certain information. So you might say here 
that we are conditioning uh, this probability uh, uh, on information that the student is in party B. So this highlighted information here is is the kind of conditioning information. And typically we, we use the phrase given certain information. So conditioning or given certain information, we ask a probability statement. So we could we could write this, you know, again in some kind of faux notation where we could say, what's the probability of being a woman given that I know they are in party B? Here's my kind of abusive notation, but um, again, this is called conditional probability. Okay, so how can we calculate this given the table above? <clears throat> Let's go back up to our table. So now we're going to condition on the fact that they're in party B. So we actually can just restrict our information to all the information about party B. And the total number of students in party B, if we kind of sum up and put it in the margin of our table, looks like there are 361 students in party B, and of them, 123 are women. So we could calculate this probability as 123 out of 361, or approximately 34% are women in party B. So if I'm given the fact that we're in party B, probability they're women is 34%. Notice we have a big difference between the unconditional probability, which it tells us that 55% of the students are women, and the conditional probability where given information, it drastically changes the probability. And we're able to calculate that probability basically by restricting the information we look at. So we could kind of represent this with a Venn diagram. So here's my Venn diagram. Here's my total sample space of all students, S for students. Here is my event of being a woman. And um, let's say that you can either be in party A or party B. So A and B uh, partition the sample space. So A to the left, B to the right. Uh, okay. Given this, our first question, question one, was we wanted the probability of being a woman, just overall. So the probability of being a woman, pictorially, if we think of probabilities as area, we could represent this as, let's say, um, the ratio of, so we're gonna divide two numbers, of the area of all of S, and we were going to divide through this circle. So the area of being a woman divided through by the area of the entire sample space of all students. So we could write area of that and divided by area of that. Our second question was probability of being a woman given that the student is in party B. And we could pictorially represent this, again, as a ratio of areas. <clears throat> and uh, so what are the areas we want to take the ratio of? Well, we're going to restrict ourselves to live in just event B here. We don't actually care about the information in, in event A, we care about the information in event B. 
And so it's the ratio of the area of B, the denominator there, and in our numerator, what we want to um, look at is among those students in B, how many of them are women, which is going to be this part. That I'm going to shade in red here. So it's the area of this red uh, half circle or partial circle. <clears throat> so it's the area of that, of that kind of partial circle in red divided by the total area of everyone in B. So if we think about this in set notation, so let's go to the left here, we could actually write this out kind of formally in set notation. It would be, again, the area of B, but we could rewrite the top as the intersection between B and this event of being a woman. So we could maybe write it like that, a little abusive notation wise. The intersection between woman and being in B divided by the um, area of B. Another way of saying it is it's the, it's the number of women uh, in party B, that is the number of people who are women and in party B divided by the number of people in party B. Okay. So that's our, our motivating example. This kind of thinking where if I want to say condition on some information from event B, I want to condition the probability of some event, in this case being a woman, on some other event, in this case being part of B, I can look at the area of, or as we'd say, the probability of, uh, of the event and being in my conditioning event, in this case B, divided by the probability of that conditioning event. So this motivates a definition of conditional probability. Um, so let's formally define conditional probability. So the definition is that if I have two events, A and B, and they're subsets of my sample space, then if as long as my probability of B is not zero, we'll get to Y, that has to be true. We can say the probability of A given B. So this bar here is read as given. So you read this whole thing uh, all together as the probability of A given B. So the probability of A given B is going to be defined to be the probability of the intersection of A and B over the probability of B. And that's all. That's our definition. That's not too bad of a definition. So notice if we scroll back up here a little bit, that's basically what we were looking at before intersection between the event we want the probability of and the conditioning event over the probability of the conditioning event. And that comports with kind of the, the picture we had here of what's going on. So that's our definition of conditional probability. Notice that because probability of B is in the denominator, we need it to be non-zero, right? If it's zero, we have a problem. We can't divide through by zero. So there's a, there's a um, requirement here that the probability of B be positive. Um, it, in practicality, it's not a real big issue. So that's the definition of conditional probability. You should kind of burn that into your memory. The probability of A given B is the probability of the intersection of A and B over the probability of B.
Let's talk about some facts. Facts about Gaum theorem. Um, I'm going to call them facts. So facts about conditional probability. And so uh, henceforth, uh, that's not how you spell that. Henceforth, assume that probability of B is bigger than zero. Now, whenever I condition on an event, I'm going to tacitly assume that its probability is non-zero. Otherwise, it's not well defined. Okay. What are some facts? First of all, if I want to calculate the probability that B occurs, given that B occurs, what do you think that should be? You can pause and you can think. In layman's terms, it is the probability that B occurs given we know that B occurs. Well, if we're given we know that B occurs, what's the probability B occurs? 100%? Well, we write one in this case. It better happen, it has to happen. So we're gonna say that that is one. Of course, that's a, that's a fact, so we can prove it if you want. Now, the probability, and this is true for any event, B with positive probability. Probability of B given B is 1. Probability of an event happens given you know what happens is 1. Okay, proof. This is going to come very straightforwardly from our definition of conditional probability. Probability of B given B is the probability of the intersection, so B intersect with B, over the probability of conditioning event B. And B intersect B is just B. We still have a probability of B in our denominator. Well, and behold, that gives us one. That's a nice little kind of one line proof there. Okay. Another fact. If A and B are disjoint, so can you recall what disjoint means? Disjoint means that the intersection is empty. That is, they are mutually exclusive, is kind of how we think about it in layman's terms. They cannot co-occur. A occurs, B can't happen. If B occurs, A can't happen. Right? Why do we know that? We know that the probability of A and B happening is the probability of the empty set, which we proved, in, say, lecture two or so. That's zero. So the question is, or the theorem we're going to propose is, what is the probability of A given B? So first think about it in layman's terms. What is that saying? It's saying, what's the probability that A occurs given we know B occurs? Well, if A and B are disjoint, then they cannot co-occur. And so the probability that a occurs if B occurs should be zero. If B occurs, you know A can occur. The probability A occurs given B occurs, zero. So I'm gonna posit that that's zero, assuming that these things are disjoint here. So when you come up with a proof, again, we're just gonna use our basic definition of conditional probability. And so probability of A given B is the probability of the intersection over probability of the conditioning event. But lo and behold, as we wrote up here, if these things are disjoint, then, the pro then A intersect B is empty. Is probability of the empty set over probability B, which is zero over something non-zero. Doesn't matter, it's zero as we claim. So those are some nice little facts about conditional probability. Let's look at an example um, how you might calculate a conditional probability. Okay. Example. Um, what do we want the example to be? Let's go back to roll and dice. Roll to Dice. And the question 
I'm going to propose is what is the probability uh, the first die I roll is a 2. Now I'm going to make this a conditional probability problem by saying given. Now it's conditional. And what, what event do I want to condition on given the sum of the dice uh, is that's supposed to be dice. Dice is less than or equal to five. So unlike some of the previous problems that were pretty straightforward to calculate, I actually don't really have a strong intuition for what that should be. But that's okay. You know, the point of this class is that we can calculate probabilities for things we don't have strong intuitions about. We can go through the, the, the rules of probability and come out with an answer, and we don't have to kind of intuitively understand. Okay, so let's solve this. We need to define two events. Right, um, and of course, to define the events, we should really think about what our sample space is. So, what's our sample space here? Our sample space is all possible dice rolls. So, I could say that's i sub j, where i and j are between one and six. So, let's write it like that. You could you can represent them as ordered pairs, and uh, you should be able to count now. That's 36 possible outcomes, which is what? Sampling from six things to, care about the ordering, and uh, we're sampling with replacement. So that's our sample space. And the and two events we want are, let's say, the first is that the, the die is a two, that the first die is a two. This blue thing here, let's call A. And so let's underline in black here. The second, the conditioning event, which is that sum of the two is less than or equal to five. So those are our two events. Those are both certainly uh, you know, subsets of our sample space. Um, and so let's calculate. We can now kind of write this out in notation. This is the probability of A given B, which of course we know by our rule of conditional probability or a definition of conditional probability is prob AB over prob B. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways to do this. I think uh, one kind of instructive way to do it is to just draw a table. So let's draw a table of possible rolls. First die, die could come, could get, uh, have a roll one, two, three, four, five, six. And the second one, whoops, could also have a roll of one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? Here's my table. Of possible roles. Just draw out some lines here. Okay. And uh, so A again was my event here that the first dice is is a two. First dice, first die is a two, and this B is that the sum of the two less than or equal to five. Okay, so oh, let's make that a different color just for the sake of uh, not being super confusing. Let's make that green. This is the sum less than or equal to five. Okay, first look at, look at B. For which events is the sum less than or equal to five? Certainly, one, 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 two, and three, 
and 1, 4. 1, 5 won't work because that sum is 6. 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. 2, 4 is not going to work because that's 6. 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 6. So that won't work. And then 4, 1. So those green circles represent, so up here we have the first die, and then here we have the second. The green circles represent B. And let's put blue X's through event A. So notice that this table is basically a representation of the sample space, because the sample space you can represent as a grid or a table for a simple problem like this. So the first of the two is, is 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, or 2, 6, right? It's any of the outcomes where 2 is the first one. And then so it's 2 and whatever else. So that's the uh, event A. And the event A intersect B is going to be the ones where they overlap, which is those three events. And so we can pretty much directly go and calculate a probability now. If assuming, so I guess we kind of have to specify this, is that all the outcomes are equally likely, then this probability we know is just the size of AB over the size of B, right? Or more formally, the size of AB over the size of S divided by the size of B over the size of S. And of course, that one over size of the sample space cancels. So this is just size of AB over size of B. And we said there are three events in A intersect B. And how many in B? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 30% probability, three tenths. So that's kind of a nice little discrete conditional probability, uh, probability problem. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about what the rules are for what we're allowed to do with conditional probability. In what ways does conditional probability behave like um, the other kind of probability um, we've talked about so far, right? So we first developed what was called, you know, if you go back, we talked about what defines a valid probability function. So a valid probability function satisfies Kolmogorov's axioms. And if we have a valid probability function, we derived a bunch of rules about what you're allowed to do with it. And it would be really sad if we developed this conditional probability function, but it has a play with a whole different set of rules. Luckily, it doesn't. So here's the theorem, and it's not going to be immediately obvious why this is important, but I'll make the argument. Uh, conditional probability uh, defines a valid probability function. I'm supposed to read function here. Fn function. So I'm not sure what does that mean, and. Uh, why is that important? So, first of all, what does it mean? If I condition on event B, assume we fix some event B, and we condition on B. Um, and so I could uh, calculate, say, uh, let's say, then for any event, I'd like to call it E in my sample space, so B is also in my sample space, or any other event E in my sample space, you know, we, we have this rule that says we can calculate probability of E 
B according to our definition, which is the intersection over probability B. Alternatively, I could use different notation. I could say maybe P, and I'm going to put a subscript B, and I'm going to put the E in parens, so P sub B of E. It's just different notation. But it emphasizes that you can think of this, this whole thing, if we fix B, this is a function of of um, that accepts um, events in my sample space. So you could think of PB, that is PB, you can think of it as a function from, that's my notation, you know, my not great notation for power set of a sample space. That's the set of all sample of, of, of subsets, the, the set of all events to the real numbers. So P sub B, if I fix B, a, I could define a, a function that takes in a, an event and gives me the probability of that event now conditioned on B. That's a function from the power set of S from all possible events to the real numbers. So where have we seen that before? That's what probability functions are. Well, that's what probability functions are, assuming they satisfy the Kolmogorov maxim. So what you need to think about or prove, convince yourself, I'm not gonna go through the whole long proof, not, not too bad, but the, the third axiom is a little, a little hard to, a little cumbersome to show, but convince yourself that this function, P sub B, satisfies the Kolmogorov axioms. The first two axioms are pretty easy to show. Um, I should be a little more specific. It satisfies the Kolmogorov axioms um, yeah, let's just let's just leave it there. It should satisfy the Kolmogorov axioms. so let's let's think about I'll, maybe I'll do one and two here um, and leave three as an exercise. What's our first Kolmogorov axiom? First combo of axiom is, is positivity, non-negativity um, of the measure, of the probability measure, which is, so it should be that P sub B of any event E bigger than or equal to zero. Can I prove that? Well, P sub B of E is, by definition, P of E B over P of B. That's certainly positive. Both the numerator is positive, some probability, and the denominator is positive, and some other probability. Axiom one, axiom two says that probability P sub B of S is one. What's my proof? P sub B of S is P of, uh, write it, S intersect B over P of B. S intersect B, is just B, because B is a subset of S. So we get P of B over P of B, which is one. So that second axiom is satisfied. There's a third axiom, countable additivity. It's not so bad, you can show it, but I'm not gonna go through it. So what's my point here? Is that if I, if I kind of fix B, I could kind of ignore that part and this conditional probability behaves just like any other probability. Basically, another way of thinking about this is that basically, so here's my Venn diagram of my sample space and here's my Venn diagram of B. We are basically, by conditioning on B, we are redefining the probability measure so that the probability of B is 1, right? 
remember that probability of B given B, our kind of fact was that that, that is one. And so this conditional probability here is basically redefining the sample space where instead of the, the measure, the probability measure being one in the entire sample space, now it's one on, on even some subset of B. And why do we care? If I fix um, B, I can, uh, I can manipulate Uh, I can manipulate probability of, say, whatever given B like any other probability function. Why can I do that? It is a probability function. This, this thing of P of some argument, let's just say dot given B, is a probability function. So I can kind of Treat that thing as a probability function. For example, what's the probability of a complement given B? Well, I can just ignore the given B part and just kind of tack it on at the end. This is going to be 1 minus the probability of A given B. Why do we know that? Well, we know that theorem is true generally if I remove that conditional part. And because we, we're going to argue that we argue that this is also a probability function, that rule applies. We derive that theorem for all probability functions. Another one is, say, if I have um, two events, A1 union A2 given B, I can always apply my known rules. This is A1. But now I have to tack on a given B at the end of all the probability functions, plus the probability of A2 given B, minus the probability of A1, A2, and I tack on a given B at the end. But I can just fit, basically ignore that given B tacked on at the end of all my probability functions, and I can do any kind of normal manipulations and use all the normal theorems. That's really convenient. Um, and that's a really, really nice fact. So all the stuff we've learned so far applies to conditional probability. OK. So let's talk about some other theorems of uh, related to conditional probability. Um, and these are just kind of some nice ways of reorganizing that conditional probability formula. The theorem, uh, this is known as compound probability. The compound probability formula says that I can write the probability of A, B is probability of A given B times the probability of B or probability of B given A times the probability of A. So you, you might be able to see this is just a reordering of that conditional probability formula. I like to think of it as this probability of the B here cancels with that B and you can write it as an intersection or like you can push this A in there and remove the bar. That's kind of how I visualize it. The proof is, is pretty simple because it's kind of just a reordering of, um, of the conditional probability formula. So we're actually going to take two cases. I didn't specify that probability B has to be bigger than zero. But let's first say if probability of B is bigger than zero, then probability of A given B is according to a formula, probability of the intersection over probability of B. And now I just multiply. Hence, I get my formula. I can rearrange. Right? I can rearrange this. I just move my probability of B to the other side. I get my formula. The other case, else case, is that What's, what if probability of B is zero? Then notice that AB is a subset of B. Hence, probability of AB by a rule says this should be less than or equal to the probability of B is zero. 
so prime b is zero. All right, so prime a b is zero. Why does it help us out? That means we basically know that probability of a b is zero. So that <clears throat> left side is zero. The right side here, that probability of b is zero. Both sides are zero, and the theorem is true. Let's say so both sides are zero. So this formula actually holds even when the probability of b is zero. Now trivially, everything's zero when the probability of b is zero. And you can similarly prove this for the final case here where you switch things around. Uh, proof goes similarly. Okay, so that's called compound probability. And it's basically just a rearranging of the formula. Let's talk about um, a really important law and theorem. This is called the law of total probability. Well, the law because it's very important. And the law of total probability, let's draw this pictorially, is let's say I have some event B. So let me represent that as a circle here. And then I got a partition, my sample space, which is this black box into a bunch of sets. So let's say A1, A2, A3, A4, and maybe that's A5. So I'm going to partition my sample space into some partition of A, I. Question is, how, how can I use that to calculate the probability of B? We're going to drive a formula for it. So the theorem says that if I have some partition, AI is a partition of S, then for any event B, we can recover the probability of B only knowing the probability of b conditioned on the a sub i if we also know the probability of the a sub i and in particular if we sum i'm going to be a little vague here about my index could be finite could be infinite but the probability of b can be recovered as the sum of the probability of b given the a sub i times the probability of a sub i. So here in green, this is like the probability, this area represents the probability of b given a1, and we have probability of b given a2, b given a3, b given a4, b given a5, right? So the areas of those relative to the area of b is that conditional probability. And then the area of, um, so this is like area of a sub i relative to area of b. <clears throat> uh, that's not correct. Let's, ba let's back up here. It's like the area of b intersect a i relative to area of a i. Now that's correct, right? <clears throat> that would be B given A sub I. And the second part is like the area of A sub I relative to area of S. And so if we multiply those, we basically get the area of B relative. So product equals area of area of B intersect AI relative to area of S, right? First is area of B intersect AI relative to AI, then we have AI relative to S. If we multiply those, I'm going to claim, gives us basically the relative area of B, A, B intersect AI to S. That is, it basically gives us the probability of B 
intersect A sub i, and I'm going to claim if I have the probability of B intersect A1 plus the probability of intersect A2, A3, A4, A5, or whatever, right? Um, we saw previously that was what we so called partitioning um, of the event. We saw we could recover the probability of B. The other way of thinking about it is basically it's a weighted sum of B given A sub I weighted by the probabilities of the A sub I. Either way works. The proof of this is actually not so bad. Um, notice that given our compound uh, probability theorem from above, this says that probability of B given a sub i times probability of a sub i is just the probability of the intersection b intersect a sub i. So that's kind of step one. And so we could say that the sum for i, probability of b given a i by probability a i is the sum over i probability of b intersect a sub i. And we know, since a sub i is partition, s, that this is the probability of b. <clears throat> and this comes from the partitioning theorem, which you should now review. And I think it is lecture two. But intuitively, if you think about it, it makes, it makes sense for what's going on. <clears throat> Okay, let's, let's stop with the theorems for a minute and let's look at a practical example. So this is called the law of total probability. It's super useful. We use it several times today on some interesting examples. Okay, so here I'm gonna give you now a probability problem that you could probably would not be able to solve without conditional probability, but given conditional, or knowledge now about conditional probability, it's gonna be kind of real simple to do. Okay, here's my example. I'm gonna have two baskets. Basket one, basket two, and uh, basket one is going to have some colored balls in it, two black balls, three white balls, and basket two is going to have a different distribution of balls, it's three black balls, and two white balls. Here's the game I'm gonna play, let's say. Here's the game. Step one, randomly select ball from basket one and put in basket two. So I'm randomly gonna take one of these ones from basket one, throw in basket two. And then two, randomly select ball from basket two. Okay, that's a, a bit more complicated than the probability problem than we've dealt with so far. Here's the question. What is the probability, assuming everything's not equally likely, any kind of selection is equally likely of choosing a black ball on step two. The question mark. So there should be some probability, but this is not obvious unless you, you can kind of uh, use the right uh, conditioning argument. Randomly select one from basket one, put it in basket two, mix them around, randomly select one from basket two. So the intuition here is that it depends, the probability is gonna, it's gonna matter whether or not I choose a white one from the first basket and put it in the second basket, right? The probability in step two depends on what I do in step one. If I choose a white one in step one, put it in basket two, I'm gonna have kind of a lower probability in step two of choosing a black ball. If I choose a black one from basket one and put it in basket two, I'm going to have a higher probability in step two of choosing the black ball. So 
Let's make some definitions here. Let w equal the event where I choose white on step one. The w complement is where I choose a black one on step one. And similarly, we're going to let b be the event where I choose a black one on step two. And that makes b complement where I choose a white one on step two. Okay, with those definitions, what do I actually want to calculate? What I want to calculate is say what I want is P of B. I want the probability I choose a black ball on step two. Okay. How can we solve this? Use law of total probability. So that law of total probability, well, that's supposed to read probability, probability. The law of total probability kind of in the abstract doesn't seem super useful, but what it's going to allow me to do, if I scroll back up to my law, is that it allows me to calculate the probability of some event when I only know kind of conditional information. So in order to use the law, we have to partition. Notice that um, the collection of W and W complement, of course, that partitions my sample space. So I'm going to use that in the role of A. So use in role of A I in that theorem. So that's kind of what I'm going to partition on. If I do that, I can calculate the probability of B as well, now I only have um, two things. I goes one, two, right? So it, the law of total probability, law of total probability, in this case says it's the probability of, I want the probability of B, probability of B given the first partitioning element, W, times the probability of that first partitioning element, plus probability of B given the second partitioning element times the probability of that second partitioning element. So I'm going to claim now that we had an intractable problem to start with, where we didn't really know how to attack it. We actually know all of these things now. Because well, so let's talk about it. What do we know? What's P of W? What's W? W is I choose a white ball on the step one. Well, what is my basket here? On step one, my basket is two blacks and with three whites. So what's the probability I choose a white? Three-fifths. What's the probability I choose a black one in the first one, which is W complement? Two-fifths. And, okay, so those two, we know easily, right? Now we want to calculate P of B given W. So P of B given W is the probability I choose black on second step given I choose white on one, right? So if I choose white on one, so originally my basket two looks like this. Three black balls, two white, right? If I choose a white ball on one, I'm going to add in another white one here, right? So in this case, so this is basket two given white on the first one. In this case, the probability of black 
given I chose white on the first one, is one half, right? And the other thing we need to calculate here, that gives us P of B given W. P of B given W we know a lot about. And so this law of total probability allows us to use things that we actually know. The other thing I want to calculate is probability of B given I don't choose a white one on the first one. So again, before step one, what does basket two look like? It looks like three black ones, two white, right? My basket two was three black and two white. And if I look at basket two given, I choose a black one on the first, that is W complement, throw another black one in here. And uh, that gives me what? One, two, three, four, four, six, uh, two thirds. So this is, of course, P of B given W complement. So if we scroll back up here, we can now fill in the last things here. P of B given W is one half. P of B given W complement two thirds. All right. If I choose a white one first, I'm less likely to choose a black one the second. If I choose a white one, black one the first, I'm more likely to choose a black one the second. So that's everything we need for the formula. What's left is just kind of plugging it in. Um, anyone able to do that in their head? Um, let's see if I can embarrass myself here. That's three tenths plus uh, four fifteenths, uh, which is nine thirtieths plus eight thirtieths, which is what seventeen thirtieths which is bigger than one half, right? A little bit bigger than one half, a little over 50%. So <clears throat> that's interesting. Notice, recall that um, what do we want to say here? We want to say that well, it's, uh, we don't want to say anything. Let's leave it there. So it gives us a way of calculating the probability. Um, and so that's why the law of total probability is quite useful. Um, it gives us a way of calculating the probability of something if we only kind of know things about that thing condition on some partitioning events and something about the partitioning events. Okay. So that's a very classic example of the law of total probability, and we will see that again uh, in this class. Okay. Next kind of rearrangement of this conditional probability formula. So you basically have seen we're just kind of rearranging um, the formula and point, I'm kind of pointing out the useful ways you can rearrange this formula. The next theorem is called Bayes' theorem. Yeah. And Bayes' theorem is a way of, of calculating, let's say, probability of A given B using probability of B given A. So it allows us to convert from a world, um, if I knew B, probability of B given A, how could I use that to flip it around and get probability of A given B? So the theorem says, Let's say we have two events, A and B, and the probability of A and the probability of B are both positive. Bayes' theorem says that I can calculate the probability of A given B, and this can be related to the probability of B given A. I'll flip around to that. And if related to this way, it is the probability of B given A times a number. What number? It's the probability, it's the ratio between A and B. So it's probability of B given A times probability of A divided by probability of B. 
And again, this is a kind of basically just a rearrangement of our conditional probability formula. And so the proof is pretty straightforward. Probability of A given B is our definition of conditional probability is that it's AB over probability of B and compound probability. So this is step one is just a definition. Again, we can exploit our kind of compound probability law and say that this is, um, well, first let's write it as B intersect A, right? I can flip around, I can commute um, A and B uh, in a intersection. And now you, so let's say this is that step is just muting things. Now we can use our compound probability law and say that this is probability of B given A times probability of A. And of course we have to trail around our probability of B in the basement. So we got a nice little kind of one line proof here. So let's see. Um, let's go back to our previous example as a little example of Bayes' theorem. So example, continue previous. And Bayes' theorem allows us to kind of ask other kind of interesting questions. So let's say given I choose a black ball on the second, what is the probability I chose a white ball on step one? So it's asking the flip of the question, right? First time we said, what's the probability I choose a black on the second given I choose a white on the first, or just straight up, what's the probability I choose a black on the second? Now I can say, I can kind of flip around and say, okay, I chose a black on the second. I don't know what they did in the first. What's the probability I chose a white one on the first? So given our notation from that problem, this is the probability that I chose a white on the first given chose a black on the second. So it's probability of W given B. And Bayes' theorem says, well, I don't actually know anything about W given B. What we knew things about is B given W, right? We had calculated that in the previous problem. So let's let's use that information. So let's flip this around. I can rewrite this as probability of B given W, but I have to pay a penalty. And the penalty is I have to multiply by, now we gotta get the ratio correct, probability of W divided by probability of B. And Lo and behold, I know all of those things from the previous problem, right? So let's go back up. Probability of B given W. We said it was one half. Ooh. One half. Probability of W. Uh, we said it was three fifths. And the probability of B, we calculated last time, was. 1730s. And it is what it is. It's some number um, uh, that we can calculate. But it allows us to calculate uh, kind of the converse probability, as it were. Okay. So the last theorem and last example I want to do for this lecture is what we want to do is now take so we've basically been building up theorems with that definition of conditional probability. We talked about some examples and we talked about this compound probability law, which is just a rearrangement of it. We talked about how we could combine that with our uh, partitioning argument to get what we we'll call the law of total probability. And we also said, well, we can rearrange conditional probability and compound in a different way to get what we call Bayes' theorem. So now we can co combine the law of total probability with Bayes. So theorem, law of total probability plus Bayes, right? which is kind of building up 
different conditional probability laws and combining them in new and interesting ways. So law of total probability, we had to have a partition. So let's say a sub i is a partition of uh, a sample space. And b is some event in my sample space. I can combine these. I'm going to write the definite, the, 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 um, the rule, and then we can kind of argue why it's true. If this is true, we can say that the probability of a sub i given b. So before we, in our law of total probability, we had b, we're going with the probability of b. I'm going to now kind of include Bayes in here. So we're going to look at A sub I given B. The law of the probability, uh, we, we knew something about the probability of A sub I, and we knew something about B given A sub I. So we're going to flip that around and talk about A sub I given B. This is the probability of B given A sub I times the probability of A sub I divided through and now we're going to basically use the law of total probability. So let's be a little vague about our indices. Let's just say it's sum over j of probability of b given a sub j times probability of a sub j. Right? And this is sum over all possible j. When I write it like this with no index, it's just a sum over all possible. So this is feels a little bit like Bayes' theorem, and it feels a little bit like law of total probability, in it, and it is actually just a combination of the two. But let's do, say the proof or the argument for it, right? So the law of total probability of total probability, we knew, what did we know? We knew probability of B given A sub I, and we, um, would we use to calculate? Uh, we knew probability of A sub I, and we calculated probability of B, right? And in fact, we can write out the theory, the, 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 the answer. We calculated probability of B as the sum. We can use J instead of I. We used, um, so let's just, L, let's just change the indices here. A sub J, A sub J. Doesn't really matter. We said that this is probability of uh, whoops, this is probability of B given a J times probability of a J. And Bayes, Bayes theorem, what we know, we knew, in this case, we want to apply Bayes to A sub I and B. So let's say we know probability of Again, B given A sub I, and we know probability of B, and we know probability of A sub I, right? And we were able to calculate, if we knew those, we were able to calculate the kind of reciprocal or flip around of A sub I given B as probability of B given A sub I, and then we had to multiply by A sub I over probability of B, right? And this is just a review of these two laws, right? And what we can do is, so notice that we know the same things for each of them. We know this, we know this, we know this, we know this. Oh. Also, let's back up. These four, you know, B given the A sub J, yes. So we know B is given A sub I, we know probability of A sub J's, so we know the probability of A sub I. And in this case, we didn't actually know probability of B, but we could calculate it over here with the law of total probability. So I can basically take this formula from the law of total probability and throw it in my basement here for probability of B. And it allows me to calculate it in terms of just the probability of the A sub I and the probability of B given A sub I. And if you throw that in there, you get exactly the formula above, right? Where it's probably B given A sub I times probably A sub I divided by 
well, the song, which is exactly what law tells Bradbury to guess. This is a super useful law. Um, and let's look at an example, a um, fairly relevant example these days. So this is the example that I give uh, typically for this problem, uh, for this theorem. Uh, and it is super relevant these days. So here's, you can guess at how this is relevant. Here's my example, okay? I have some disease. Now let's just make it about COVID-19. So COVID, COVID-19 has a prevalence rate rate of, well, let's make up a number. Let's say 1%, okay? I don't know what it actually is. Maybe that's it. And you can go and get tested for COVID or not, right? So if I go and get a test, so we test for COVID. Oops, COVID. 19 and get either a positive result or a negative result. Hopefully indicating that either we have the disease or we don't. So I'm just writing down some facts. So this is kind of fact one, fact two, fact three is that, well, we're kind of making up some numbers, but this is talked about all the time these days. The test accurately reports a positive result 95% of the time. Right? So this is called the test sensitivity. The probability of getting correctly getting a positive result. Well, we'll talk about exactly what it is, but basically, if I have a disease, it's the probability of getting a positive result. Kind of conversely, the test accurately reports a negative result let's say 99% of the time. And these are made up numbers, but you can, you can play around with them and you can realize why there's uh, so much discussion of this. So what do I do? I go and get a COVID test, right? You don't actually know if you have disease or not, but you get a test to help you determine if you have the disease. Let's say I get a positive result. What is the probability this is correct? Right? That's actually what everyone wants to know, right? You get a positive result. It could be right. It could be wrong. The test could have malfunctioned. It might not be sensitive enough. So we have sensitivity. We also have the what's called the specificity. You see these in the news, now you know exactly what they are. I can write that specificity. Specificity is if I don't have disease, what's the probability it tells me you don't have the disease. So what everyone knows is they go get a test, they get a positive result, and what they want to know is, okay, is that correct? We now actually have the tools to answer this. You, you now have the tools to answer these kind of epidemiological questions. And this is a you know, kind of really relevant uh, question people talk about, the sensitivity, specificity of these tests. You'll see these terms thrown around. You kind of have a sense now, hopefully, what these things are. Okay, so let's, let's write some notation for all of this. So COVID-19 has a prevalence rate, rate of 1%. Let's say um, D is equal to have the disease, so that's going to be my event. I have the disease. D complement is I don't have the disease. 
And this 1% prevalence rate says that if I randomly select someone, let's write this more legibly. If I randomly select someone, the probability of D is 1%, 0.01. We go for a test and we either get a positive or a negative. So the sensitivity, which I'm saying is 95%, is the probability that, very specifically, that if given I have the disease, what's the probability it gives me positive? So give probability I get a positive result if I know I have it. We're saying that's 0.95. So you can estimate these various tests. You get, you have someone you, you think you know has it. You have a bunch of people you think you know have it. You give them the test, you see what proportion of them come back positive. That gives you an estimate of your sensitivity, something statisticians will do. Specificity is kind of uh, the mirror image. It's given I don't have disease, what's the probability that I get a negative result? So, um, and you can you can estimate these things. These are made of numbers. If you can estimate them, you get a bunch of people you think you don't that don't have the disease. Maybe you have some gold standard other test, and you give them the test, and hopefully most of them come back negative. Right? So that's called specificity. Okay, so now we're getting the kind of the language of probability where we can actually calculate something. So here's the the question: I go and get a COVID nineteen test, I get a positive result. So what I want to do is calculate the probability that Given I received a positive result, I want to know the probability this is correct. Well, what's correct? See that I have the disease. Well, let's calculate the probability I have the disease given I get a positive result. So now it's starting to look like Bayes' theorem, law of field probability, that kind of thing. Because I know something about sensitivity and specificity. I know something about the pre prevalence rate. And so I kind of want to calculate the converse. Let's move this over here. Using our previous theorem, we can write this as probability positive given I have disease, that is the sensitivity rate, which we know, times the probability I have disease, the prevalence rate, which is D of D, which we know. So we're rewriting something we don't know in terms of things we do know. And if I plug in my formula, my partition here, is D and D complement. Those partition, they partition S, right? So that's what I'm partitioning on, right? Those pl play the role um, of the A sub I. So if I plug in my formula, it's probability positive given D. So B is equal to positive in this case. A sub one is equal to D, A sub two is equal to D complement, let's say. And what I really want is probability of A one given D. All right, that's how you write in that notation, but it doesn't matter. We can write it out, plug it in our formula. And that's what we get. And we know all these numbers now, right? So this is 0.95 times 0.01 divided by 0.95 times 0.01 plus, um, what is this? This is 0.99, which is the specificity rate times 0.99. A little hard to read, but that's what it comes out to be. I can do that calculation if I do that calculation. It turns out to be, about 0.49, or about 50-50. That's actually a bit of a surprising result often, um, which is that I had a, and that's correct, I had a very sensitive test, 95% of the time it tells me I have a positive result if I have the disease, and a very specific test gives the um, a negative result given I don't have disease 99% of the time. But if I go and get a, a positive test, I actually come back and the probability to get a, a um, have disease given I have positive result is actually about 
Um, and the reason for that is, is um, you know, is it has a low prevalence uh, in the population. And uh, while these tests are sensitive and specific, not as sensitive and specific as we'd like. So this doesn't comment on anything about the, the actual, these are all made up numbers, but um, it gives you a, a, it's a little bit surprising when people see that. Okay, so we'll stop there. So that's kind of our lecture on conditional probability. And next time we're gonna talk about independence, as I promised, um, which is the follow on topic uh, for conditional probability.